this is true about today's subject, patience. Patience is easy until it's not easy. You know, any of us can begin with patience, but we hit that 40-second mark. We hit that 50-second mark. We hit that one-minute mark, and we lose our grip. Yesterday, I was at a Starbucks doing some early morning study. And this lady in front of me was using her Starbucks app on her phone. This is supposed to speed up the process. My bag was over on my table. I was worried somebody would come and take the bag. So I wanted her to hurry it up. So I was glad initially that she was using the app until I saw her Hey, you know, we were there for about seven minutes. Her messing with her app. I was so tempted to lean over with some money and say, I'll pay for her. <laughs> you know, I mean, how hard could it be to wait for the lady in front of you to get her coffee? It was easy until it wasn't. Well, I thought I was a patient guy. But Amazon knows better. That's why they have two-day delivery. That's why for those who can't wait for two days, they have fulfillment centers. Make you really feel good. Hey, some of you guys remember the old days? McDonald's had this program. Your food in 60 seconds, oh, it's free. After all, it's called fast food, right? Well, you've been through a McDonald's lately? You don't get your food in 60 seconds. In fact, every once in a while, I get behind this car full of people, and they're ordering their dinner. And they're sitting there, and mom is trying to ask each of the kids over and over to give their preferences. And you're waiting there in line for 15 minutes, and you want to pull out, but guess what? There's cars behind you. There's no other lane, and you're stuck there. So much for fast food. We're always in need of the grace of patience. We need it for others, of course, putting up with other people. But you know, sometimes we even need it for what? Ourselves. I've been waiting 10 years to get back to my pre-Mandarin Baptist wait. Okay. I haven't had the time to do the kind of training that I used to do when I was running marathons. And little by little, it's been on there and I'm getting so impatient with myself. But you know, you're learning a new skill. And it's taking some time. And uh, you know, you may need to be retrained for a new job. And it's not quite sinking in. Or you're waiting to buy a house. And you're watching the interest rates. And it doesn't seem to be in your favor. Are you looking forward to kids or grandkids and retirement? Whatever it is, life is full of opportunities and necessities for patience. Sometimes we even need to have patience with God. Remember Moses taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. Imagine a modern version of Moses driving this huge bus. Call it a tour bus. See three million people. Okay. And so he's driving this bus, and they are just about getting there, and he's been listening to the complaining, complaining, complaining. You know, it's too hot, Moses. 
oh, the scenery on this route is terrible, Moses. Uh, or the person I'm sitting to has body odor, Moses. It, it goes on and on and on. And finally they get there, and they send in the spies, and the spies come back and says, you know, those guys are too big for us to fight. Let's go back. And Moses has to put in another 40 years in the desert waiting for those people because of those people. And Moses is saying all along, God, what exactly is your plan? What's going on here? Why are we going through this? And you know, this kind of stuff is memorialized for us in the Bible. Psalms that start off talking about waiting for God. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? <laughs> That's pretty stark, right? Uh, or Habakkuk, he begins chapter 1, verse 2. He says, how long, O oh Lord? Waiting is a part of this life and of this lifetime. And even when we do have some measure of patience, there are other elements that get added on that makes it more unbearable. Right? When you're feeling some pain, you know, waiting is really hard. Um, somehow, that pain makes the waiting even worse than it could be. Or when a deadline is missed, oh boy. Certain people in our lives are harder to be patient with. A certain relative, a certain coworker. I had this one lady, she complained about a workmate in the desk behind her. And I said to her, well, what is it that this person does that bothers you so much that you say, She's driving you crazy. She's always chewing gum and she smacks her gum. I'm thinking, how loud can that be? But you know, for her, it was a real issue. And her role in the, audio, uh, in the office, she, she started off as a top employee, favored by her supervisor and boss. And eventually she lost her job because little by little, she lost connection with everybody in her workplace. You know, she was not able to handle it. And so there are certain people. Patience seems easy until it's not, and then I run into problems, and I have to downgrade the assessment of my patience. Well, this is the second of our topics about how to show grace. And the gift of grace to others in the way of patience is far more important than we might think, especially in God's eyes, if not in our eyes. Because, you know, for some of us, we may think of patience as kind of a wimpy virtue. I mean, when you take patience, and you put it next to courage. You put it next to honor and integrity. You put it next to love and peace and joy. Huh. Is patience that important? Is it that great? Isn't it kind of like a third tier? If I were writing a letter of recommendation for your college application or for your job, would you want me to spend a paragraph talking about your patience? You'd probably want me to talk about other things, right? How smart you are and all that sort of stuff. And so we tend to think of it not the way God thinks of it. As I was preparing this message, I was actually blown away by how big patience is in the Bible. And just to give you an initial sense of it, it's in good company with other virtues that the Bible talks about. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Patience. 
When 1 Corinthians talks about agape love, you know what's the first descriptor of love? Unconditional? Patience. So it's in pretty good company. Years ago, I noticed something. I noticed how God would choose his heroes and leaders. And he looked for patience. So patience is very important. We're going to look at a passage in a moment, and we're going to read about this. But let me give you some background. This is from the book of James, the letter of James, actually. And what had happened was this. In Acts chapter 8, in the history of the church, it describes a great persecution that fell on the church of Jerusalem. And it was such a great persecution that the church was just blown apart. And the Christians had scattered to the four winds, and the only people left behind were the core leadership, including James, the brother of Jesus. And so as these Christians went all over and the persecution continued from their Jewish relatives, from their Jewish leaders in their community where they still had to exist, things got hard. And so he writes this letter of recommendation of what to do. And he's saying, basically, you know what? You need more patience in order to put up with this persecution because you're losing patience and now you're fighting with each other. You're grumbling against each other and you're falling apart. You ever see a good ball team where they, the players, even though they're stars, and they start to lose patience with each other and they're no longer getting along? And even though they have the talent to be the champions, they end up quite mediocre. Well, far worse for the church because in their grumbling, there was a real danger that they would lose the community that they desperately needed in order to get through the persecution. So we're going to read these eight verses. And in these eight verses, the word for patience comes up eight times. In fact, by the time you get to the end of it, James has kicked up the idea of patience into a higher level, which is called steadfastness in some translations and perseverance. This is super patience, okay? This is gutted out level patience. So let's turn to James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, and I'm going to ask that we read it together. James chapter 5, and we're going to start there. All right, you see the word patient? Just like I promised, all right? Let's read it out loud together, verse by verse. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Well, that could be a long time. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains? You also, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, it's not talking about ordinary patience. It's talking about pretty high-level patience, the patience of the prophets and the patience of Job. And, you know, there was nobody more patient than Job. And what happens is, this is at the end of this letter of advice, but actually in verse, in chapter one, verses two to four, the same 
theme, that patience is the answer to your persecution. Patience will see you through to the end until Jesus comes. And he says, this is how it works. Um, And so what it is is this. Patience is easy until it's not. But at the same time, on the other hand, the positive side is patience is God's spiritual secret. Long ago, I read a book called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. Well, this is God's spiritual secret for success for his people. That this is what we need to develop and this is how we're going to be discipled. Uh, You can all start very quickly into something and think that you've got it, like patience, and you don't. I remember the first time I went bowling, I was in high school. And somewhere in that first game, I managed to get three strikes in a row. Yeah, I got a turkey. And that practically quadruples your score. And I ended up in my first game with a score of 158. I have never since then come anywhere close. (laughs) That was beginner's luck. Well, beginner's luck is all right if you're just messing around. But if you're going to be a professional bowler and you're going to make your living on it, you better not rely on luck. You better have something that you can count on when the going gets tough. And that's what God does with patience. In his discipleship, he's always used patience. Remember the first guy that God discipled in the Bible? Abraham. Abraham, I got some promises for you. You're going to have a son. Great, Lord. How long am I going to have to wait for this son? 25 years later, okay? He says, you're going to have a land. Guess what? 100 years later. (laughs) You know, in all this time, Moses is being trained in his patience. And through his patience, his faith in God. You see, it's key to developing his faith. And you know, you think about anything you want to do well, to do at a high level, anything that is really special, it's going to take what? Time and patience. You don't rely on beginner's luck. Second guy who had to learn this lesson, Joseph. He needed patience. Time and again, situation over and over with different people who kept knocking him down, he had to have the patience to get back on up and move forward. And so he needed to learn about patience. Um, Let me give you another one you should know. Young David. One day Samuel appears at his house. He says, the future king is a part of this family. Bring your sons to me and I will anoint him. And finally, he gets called in first instance of patience. And after he's anointed, you know how many years he has to wait before he gets to be king? About 30 years, depending on whether he was 10 or 15 when he was anointed. And during that time, what is he doing? He's dodging spears. He's hiding in the wilderness, living in caves. Or he's hanging out with the enemies of Philistines pretending to be a psychotic, acting like a wild dog. You know, he needed to learn patience. 
then you jump over to the New Testament. And there are Saul, whom God calls and says, you're going to be my apostle to the Gentiles. And yet he has to wait to be accepted by the church. He has to wait to escape his enemies. He has to wait to set himself on a self-study program so he can rethink all of his Christianity until a guy named Barnabas comes and calls him into ministry and acceptance. Some of us are more motivated by negative examples. All right, here's two negative examples that are very well known. Moses is leading these people through the wilderness. And they come to a part where they say, Moses, we're thirsty. Are you going to let us die in the wilderness without water? And God says, I'll give these people water. Where? There's no spring. God says, I can make water flow out of a rock. Go talk to this rock, Moses. And you know, the complaining and the grumbling and putting up with the dust and everything finally gets to Moses. And what does he do? Does he talk to the rock? He strikes the rock, right? And yes, water comes out. But God judges him and says, you, for this reason, are not going into the promised land. And King Saul, the same thing. He couldn't wait for Samuel to show up to make the sacrifice to God. And he did it on his own. And as soon as he did it, Samuel shows up. You know, the whole idea was to test his patience and his faith in God's timing and God's wisdom and God's presence and control. And the thing we need to get into our heads is this. You and I live by the second, the minute, the hour, the day, the month, the year, and the years. God operates by what standard? Eternity. Yeah, that's, that's a whole different scale. And so while he's working out over eternity, we need to be patient and not try to get him down to our level and our standard. And so God has used the discipline of waiting to develop our patience, to develop our faith, and to make us the kind of people who will be something that he can really use in a number of different ways. James says this at the beginning of his letter. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. See, it's about faith. And this steadfastness is the word for perseverance. And then he says, And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be, what, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, all those who feel like they are perfect and complete and lacking in nothing, please stand up. Okay, I knew this would happen, okay? <laughs> Not a single one of us. The NIV version says you must, you must be steadfast if this is to develop. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. And what it is is this patience is what allows us to develop all of the virtues. It's the foundation for every virtue that's not going to be a flash in the pan or a moment of good luck or only when things are easy. For us to change to the kind of depth that is truly a part of our character, see, when things are easy, I've got enough emotional energy to be at my best. But when things are hard, when the pressures mount, or suddenly an emergency is going on, 
I don't have the energy to keep that kind of control. And that's why when God says, I want you to be patient, he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who's going to work this fruit of patience in your life. And so he gives us what he expects. He gives us the means to accomplish it. And what we need to do is to be humble. Because when I'm impatient with that lady in front of me at Starbucks or that car in front of me at McDonald's, you know, I was just thinking of my own self, right? My schedule, my needs. Or I was thinking I wouldn't have been so stupid with my app. Come on, it's an app. It can happen to anybody. That could have been me and her waiting on me. And so I need to be humble. I need to be humble with the girl who smacks gum in the table behind me. I need to be humble with my little kids when I say, let's get dressed for school, and they're fussing and doing all kinds of other things. I need to be humble with the people whose lives come across mine, or worse, those who are a regular part of my lives. The Bible has this prayer. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Now that's a miracle. Patience and endurance with joy, that's the opposite of what I usually am. And yet, this is our prayer. This is how God works. This is how the Holy Spirit comes. Because while he's working in our hearts, we pray to him for the power we need to be what we otherwise wouldn't be. And little by little, he changes us so that it's not about our image, but it's a natural part of ourselves. And it isn't just a small part of ourselves, but it overflows and patience touches every other virtue that we're trying to experience. That patience becomes a part of our kindness, right? Uh, That patience becomes a part of our forgiveness, that patience becomes a foundation that makes us whole, perfect, complete, mature. And so rather than to think this is a wimpy thing, as our second expression of grace, I see it now as the grace that I can practice so many times every day in all circumstances as God's spiritual secret to help me develop. So my eyes have been opened about this. When I started to preach on this topic, I just thought of it as something that we can use regularly, but it's far, far better than that, and it's something that God has always worked into the lives of his people. So for the irritating relative, I can pray for patience and for power. I can remember that the Holy Spirit is working in my life, and he's going to make it happen even when I can't. I can pray for those times when I can express high stress. You all have jobs where there are certain times of the month at certain times of the year, you can expect higher stress than usual. Or in the household, in the family, you can prepare ahead for that. Or especially for those personal sensitive areas, like my procrastination or my messiness. You know, the kind of things when people mention it, I go ballistic on them because you've touched on a sore spot. I can learn to be patient and endure when these things come up. It's okay to complain when you're having to be patient. 
but don't be acting out. Jesus complained. He says, you disciples, how long am I going to have to put up with you? But he never made it about himself. Okay? Because it's a grace development. So, what can we do? We can memorize James 1.12 that says this. And let's put it up because this is a wonderful, wonderful encouragement. Blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive what? The crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. You know? We don't have to be heroic. We can recite and memorize James 1.4 that through patience we can become complete and whole. We can memorize and recite Colossians 1.11. May I be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, Lord. And we can turn it into a prayer when we're having trouble being patient. These are practical things that help us to do it. Recently, I've been thinking, you know, God is amazing. The way he lets people on their deathbed decide that they finally want to become Christians. If you have rejected me all of your life, and on your deathbed says, you know what, I want to be your friend now. I'd say what? Too late. But God doesn't do that. God is so amazingly, incredibly patient. He wants us to be patient. Not for his sake, but for our sake. And, and I love this because, again, we can practice this so often in so many ways with so many people. Isn't that great? It's a tool we can use all the time. So anyway, that's patience. So generosity, now patience. And we'll continue to be those who can sow God's grace into the world.